Canada is moving ahead with a new kind of nuclear energy, one that is smaller, faster to build and designed to meet rising electricity demands. A crane swings overhead and one question hits fast. Is nuclear power about to change shape? Ontario is building a reactor that is not a towering giant. It is smaller, standardized and designed to be copied. Supporters say it will make Canada the first G7 country with a small modular reactor. This project will make Canada the first G7 country to have a small modular nuclear reactor. They promise clean power for 300,000 homes and long-term jobs. Critics warn the bill will rise and the timeline will slip. Either way, this is real concrete and real steel. Let's break down what is happening at Darlington right now and why the world is watching so closely today. Section 1. The promise of a smaller reactor. At Darlington, Ontario Power Generation is building what it calls the first small modular reactor project in the G7. Small modular reactors, or SMRs, are still nuclear reactors, but they are designed to be smaller in output and easier to repeat. Instead of betting everything on one massive build, the theory is that smaller units lower the risk. One unit can be finished, tested and learned from before the next one follows. Each reactor is smaller in megawatt output than Ontario's traditional large designs, but four together add up to a major power block. Ontario has built and run large reactors for decades, so the pitch is not new nuclear, but new process. The idea is to build key parts in a controlled factory setting, ship them to the site and assemble them more predictably. Backers say that is how you stay on schedule and avoid the brutal cost spirals that have haunted past builds. This is Darlington New Nuclear Phase 1, and it is meant to be the beginnings, not the end. Crews are preparing the site for Units 2, 3 and 4. Even as Unit 1 goes up, the plan is for all four units to be complete by the mid-2030S. Together, they are expected to deliver about 1,200 megawatts of electricity. Political leaders are selling it as reliable, affordable, clean power for about 300,000 homes. They also highlight jobs. Roughly 3,700 positions supported each year over the next 65 years, from construction to operations to supply work. In short, Ontario is trying to prove that nuclear can be built more like a product line than a one-off mega project. Section 2. The cost question. No one can dodge. The headline number for the four-unit Darlington plan is nearly $21 billion. Supporters argue that you should judge that cost over decades of steady output, not over a single election cycle. They also stress that nuclear plants run day and night. So the power is firm, not weather dependent. But skeptics keep pointing to the same uncomfortable truth. The first of anything is rarely cheap. Alison McFarlane, a former chair of the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission and now at the University of British Columbia, has warned that SMRs have not been built at scale in North America. That means uncertainty is baked into the schedule and the budget. Even the parts list hints at complexity. Inside a single unit, there are around 10 major forgings, heavy pieces that must meet strict standards. If one supplier slips, the whole chain can slip. And once costs start rising, the politics get messy, because nuclear is hard to pause halfway. Ontario has lived this story before. Darlington's original build faced protests in the 1970s and became infamous for debt. By the time the station came online in the early 1990s, the total cost had nearly doubled. So when critics say the 21 billion figure could climb, they are not guessing in the dark. They are reading history and asking if this new approach is truly different, or just a new label on an old risk. Section 3. The steel that makes it real. What separates Darlington from many SMR conversations is that hardware is already being made. The reactor design comes from GE Vernova and Hitachi, a US-Japanese partnership. One of the biggest components, the reactor pressure vessel, is being manufactured in Cambridge, Ontario at BWXT. Picture a thick steel body built to hold the reactor core and keep the system sealed under extreme conditions. BWXT receives large steel cylinders from Italy, then configures, fits and welds them into one long vessel. 
When the assembly is done, the unit is expected to be around 100 feet long and about 600 tons. It is not a cute, portable gadget. It is a massive industrial object that has to be perfect. This vessel is where the heat is created. That heat turns water into steam. The steam spins a turbine. The turbine drives a generator. That is how nuclear becomes electricity on the grid. The modular claim matters here because repeatable manufacturing can improve learning. Every weld, measurement and inspection creates data that can tighten the next build. If the process works, Canada gains more than one reactor. It gains a template, a skilled workforce and a supply chain that could sell parts and services to other countries that want similar plants. Section 4. Uranium, Enrichment and a Vulnerable Link Canada's nuclear story is often tied to uranium. The country has a long history in the sector and major uranium production, especially in Saskatchewan. A new reactor program could mean more demand for that uranium and more work across minings, transport and services. But this specific reactor has a fuel requirement that changes the map. It needs enriched uranium, and Canada does not currently enrich uranium for this purpose at home. So the plan is to ship Canadian uranium to the United States for enrichment, and then ship the enriched fuel back to Ontario. To supporters, that is a normal North American supply chain. To critics, it is a weak point you cannot ignore. Environmental advocate Jack Gibbons has argued that a foreign supplier could become a pressure point if politics turn. In a tense trade moment, Donald Trump or any US president could limit exports and disrupt deliveries. Ontario Power Generation says there are other options, including a French supplier. But the fact remains, the fuel path is longer and more exposed than many people assume when they hear Canadian uranium. This matters because nuclear plants do not like surprises. They are built on planning, regulation and strict operating windows. If fuel deliveries become uncertain or more expensive, that cost shows up somewhere and it usually shows up on the bill paid by ratepayers. Section 5. From fear and fatigue to a new nuclear moment. Nuclear energy has always been a battleground of emotion and math. Ontario saw that early, when protests around Darlington tried to stop the project before it was finished. Later, global accidents deepened public fear. Three Mile Island in the United States, Chernobyl in the Soviet Union, and Fukushima in Japan became shorthand for worst-case scenarios. Those events tightened rules, slowed projects, and made investors cautious. For years, it felt like the industry's best days were behind it. Now, the mood is shifting. Even careful critics admit that existing nuclear plants deliver carbon-free electricity at scale. And the pressure on the grid is rising fast. Demand is climbing from population growth, electric cars, and electrified heating. On top of that, new data centers, including those built for artificial intelligence, are hungry for steady power. Wind and solar are expanding quickly, but they need storage, transmission, and backup to cover calm nights and cloudy weeks. That is where nuclear supporters see an opening. They argue that a clean grid needs firm sources, as well as renewables. But the key word is built. Until a reactor is finished, it is only a promise on paper. That is why some experts take a pragmatic view. Keep today's nuclear running, cut emissions fast with the cheapest tools available, and be careful about pouring huge sums into projects that may take a long time to deliver. Section 6. Pride, Alternatives and the People Who Pay Ontario's government frames Darlington as a leadership play. Mark Carney has called it one of five key projects, and Doug Ford is a loud fan. The energy minister talks about building the first SMR in the G7 before the Americans, the British and the French. It is a message meant to spark pride and attract future orders. But leadership has a price, and someone has to carry it. The minister says ratepayers will pay for the project, with additional investment from both the provincial and federal governments. That raises the question nobody loves to answer. If costs balloon, who covers the gap? The honest answer is that it usually spreads across bills, taxes and time. Supporters reply with a different argument. They say Ontario has learned from painful history and has recently delivered large reactor refurbishments on time and on budget. 
they point to project discipline and tighter supply planning as proof that this time can be different. Opponents are not convinced. Groups like the Clean Air Alliance argue that wind, solar, battery storage and energy efficiency are cheaper and faster. They claim nuclear is so slow and so capital heavy that it can delay the shift away from fossil fuels instead of speeding it up. Others answer that you need both speed and stability, and that long-lived infrastructure is worth building if it holds the grid steady for decades. That is the real fight. Not nuclear versus renewables, but which mix gets emissions down fastest without breaking reliability or bankrupting the public. Darlington's SMR is being sold as a cleaner future you can pour into place, one module at a time. If it stays on schedule and near budget, Ontario could set an example and create an export story for Canadian skills and uranium. If it slips, it will fuel the old argument that nuclear promises more than it delivers. Right now, both sides have valid points. Clean power demand is rising, and the grid needs a supply. But cost overruns are real, and supply chains can snap. The only way to settle it is to build it, measure it, and learn fast.